Hi everyone and very, very welcome to this public meeting hosted by People Before Profit uh, entitled Public Housing Now Ban Cuckoo Funds. So my name is Councillor Madeleine Johansson. I will be chairing uh, this meeting tonight and uh, we have uh, a number of speakers uh, tonight uh, speaking on the topic of, of housing and uh, particularly uh, around the issue of vulture funds and cuckoo funds buying up um, whole estates in areas of, uh, of Dublin and around the country. So um, first of all just before we start uh, I'd like to just let people know that if you have any questions you can uh, put them down in the comments below and uh, I will ask the speakers those questions after the speakers have uh, have done their talks so uh, we have three speakers tonight we have Councillor Tina McVeigh we have um, Mamet Uladag and we have Gino Kenny TD they'll all be speaking for about uh, 10 or so minutes each um, and then uh, we'll go to some questions uh, so first up is Councillor Tina McVeigh she is a councillor on Dublin City Council for the uh, South Central uh, area and she is one of the uh, prominent members of the National Housing and Homeless Coalition. So Tina is going to uh, talk a little bit about the People Before Profit housing bill that's going uh, through the doll uh, tomorrow. Um, and uh, she will tell us a little bit about that and some plans that the National um, uh, Ho Homeless and Housing Coalition have, have uh, for later in the year as well. So uh, thanks very much, Tina, for being here. Thanks very much. Um, you hear me okay? Thanks, Madeline and, and Gino, for the invitation to speak about my favourite topic, housing. Um, I, as, as Madeline said, I am a councillor on Dublin City Council, so I talk a bit at a later stage about uh, my experiences of, uh, I suppose, you know, uh, sale of public land in Dublin City Council. But first of all, I want to talk about, as Madeline said, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a bill. Tomorrow is a very important day. We found out that uh, late last week that a, a bill on the right to housing that uh, that has been sitting in what they have in the doll the lotto system. You put your bill into the lotto system and then things get put out of a hat. This bill that we've had in the lotto system since 2017 is going to be tabled uh, tomorrow, Thursday, and the bill uh, deals specifically with the right to housing. And and uh, what the bill does is that it inserts into the constitution, into the Irish or proposes to insert into the constitution, uh, two new articles that will do uh, two very important things. The first thing is that it will clarify the constitution that when we talk about common good, because the, the constitution talks about the common good, that the common good includes the right to secure and affordable accommodation uh, for everyone who's resident in Ireland. The second thing, the second article um, that's proposed is to uh, make sure that in the constitution that that right to secure an affordable home uh, is uh, that that usurps uh, what currently is in the constitution, which is the right to private property. And the right to private property doesn't mean the family home. The fact that, that the right to, to private property in, in this case uh, is when we talk about um, the right, for example, of a landlord uh, to make money out. out Hi Tina, sorry, sorry to bother you. I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, just, I was wondering if you could take your headphones out because the the sounds kind of messed up. Oh really? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Maybe somebody from the audience could pop into the chat if they can hear me. Okay. Um, and I'll turn up my volume as well, so hopefully you'll be able to hear me better. So, so as I as I was saying, the the uh, so so the idea that private property or the property uh, is used to make a profit, um, well the, the the right you know your your right to a secure and affordable home will 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 trump that right. So it's basically calling into question um, the idea that you know that 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 using housing and using homes as a thanks folks much better good. <laughs> um, the idea that using housing as a way to make money, or that it's like a commodity or a privilege or a luxury, um, you know, it'll, it'll really challenge that idea. Um, and by inserting, as I said, by inserting that right into the constitution. So that, that bill is being debated tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening, and, and we're going to be 
gathering outside of the convention centre at five o'clock to, um, you know, to show solidarity and support and to uh, put pressure on the TDs in the Dáil to call them, call them on them to support uh, this right to housing. Um, it's, it's really important that, that this bill does go through. However, having said that, and I think one of the things that's really important about it is that it, it gives us this opportunity to talk about what's more important, the, 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 the right of culture funds to make loads and loads of money out of housing or the right of, of, of individuals and their families to secure and affordable housing. So we can have that debate. But it's really important to say that even into the constitution and we have a referendum and, 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 and we have it there, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to take housing that we need because I mean, if you ask, ask ourselves the question as to why we have a housing crisis, simple question, why do we have a housing crisis? The simple answer to that is because over the last number of decades, the people who've been in government, the people who've been in power, have wedded themselves to the interests of people who want to use housing and who want to use property, land, whatever, you know, buildings, uh, homes. Uh, they, they want to use that as a way to make money and they wed, the, the, the successive governments have wedded themselves um, to people who, who have that interest, whether it's landlords, whether it's big businesses, whether it's the developers. Um, and, and most recently, we have seen um, how, you know, they, they've not only formulated policies that benefit the interest of, of those that want to make money out of housing, um, but that the state itself has has uh, invested in in, a, in in investment companies. And, and like they saw this coming and they see this coming because they are the ones that are making policy. So if you're making the policy and you know that you're making policy to help, you know, to, to get a company to make loads and loads of money out of housing, well, you know, it's it's a it's, it's not too far fetched then for you to invest in that company so that you then can sell can 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 make loads and loads of money out of it. And that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a political establishment class who, as I said, are in bed with the developers, the bankers, the landlords, and now the corporate investors, the S funds, the real estate investment trusts, the cuckoo funds, and the cry that we've seen recently around um, around this level of, of state complicity essentially and not just aiding and abetting them uh, to, to, to profit off of our backs by by creating the, the the legislation and the political landscape for that but actually personally investing themselves so that they can um, also see down and you know we, we always constantly need to remind ourselves that a significant number of TDs in the doll are landlords themselves and have and are part of that uh, invested interest um, so so that that's what we're dealing with so so it's really important that we that we uh, fight right to housing that, that that this bill gets passed tomorrow that as I said we have this conversation about you know who who benefits and why and how do we change that but we have to also bear in mind that we also need to change the system we also need to change the people uh, in, in to put people in, in into into decision making roles uh, and that includes communities and people living in the communities to see into planning plan community our people and our homes and not making profit out of. And just to give you an example of, of, of I think I think that that, 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 that you know the, the veil has been pulled back and people now really see what's going on in housing uh, for what it is and, and, and that never clear to us than it was in Dublin City Council when, when a few years back um, the idea that was sell off huge swathes of publicly owned land that would sell it off to developers um, to build housing on, and that the council would only retain about 30% of those homes as, as social housing, and then another 20% as affordable housing. Um, the, uh, the, the, the outcry that ensued after, after the proposal to sell off any gardens, the public outcry and the demand that public housing um, should be built on the land was overwhelming. So put so much pressure on other councils that by the time that the same issue came up with Oscar Trader, we saw a significant shift. And and councillors didn't vote to self And in response to this, um, Fine failed previously, and now, and now, uh, Fianna have brought in the land development agency bill, which is going to allow the land development agency to privatise. Tina, all. yeah, Tina, um, I'm really sorry, Tina. But I don't know if you can hear me there, but your sound is very, very, very bad, as in we're only catching words, as in uh, a word here and a word there. So 
I think what we might do is we might just leave you for the moment, right? And um, you might see if, if there's a way that you can connect with us, um, perhaps on a different device, um, because it seems to me that it could be your device that's the issue there. So uh, maybe if you can do that. And in the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Mehmet. So um, Mehmet Uladag is a, a an activist with people before Providence in the Blanchardstown area. And just like in um, in our area, in in um, in Dublin Midwest, where I'm a councillor in the Lucan area, uh, where we have seen um, vulture funds coming in and buying up whole developments before they've even been built. Uh, in the case um, of Shackleton, the next phase of Shackleton Park in Adamstown in Lucan, uh, the same thing is happening in Blanchardstown. So I'm going to ask uh, Mehmet to to say a few words about what's happening uh, there in Blanchardstown, uh, and then maybe we can get back to Tina. Uh, and hopefully she can sort out her sound there. So, Mehmet. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, and I hope people can hear me okay. Uh, so I'll continue until until you tell otherwise, uh, assuming the sound is okay. I mean, uh, Tina obviously, sadly, we couldn't hear uh, some of the later part of her conversation, but Tina obviously uh, knows uh, quite a bit in terms of the, uh, the the details of the crisis that we are facing, crisis we, we are facing today, and has been leading campaigns and working with a lot of uh, organizations uh, 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 and community groups uh, uh, in, in the area of housing crisis. But I mean, just for a moment, if you remember uh, the years gone, I mean, there has been many problems in this country, economic and social problems, and many issues that the society has faced. But one problem that has always been very prominent, and it seems it's getting worse by day, is the housing crisis and the crisis of the homelessness in Ireland. I mean, 10 years ago, we were talking about housing crisis. Uh, uh, five years ago, we were talking about housing crisis. And today, we are talking about housing crisis. <coughs> I think uh, uh, it's also very noticeable that as time goes on, uh, the crisis doesn't get any better, it gets deeper and it gets worse for ordinary uh, uh, people of this country. And it seems the numbers on housing waiting list, uh, numbers on uh, uh, on the streets are increasing day by day under the watchful eyes of uh, 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 governments over the past uh, decade or so. And it is a shameful, shameful response by uh, governments of the same period where they pretend to understand and, and address the issue of housing but meanwhile what they really do is actually create a speculative housing market based uh, on really on vulture funds profiteering from it and housing becoming a speculative uh, matter uh, uh, in our society i think uh, this slogan uh, that housing should be a right housing should be a human right is is, is more than a, 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 a slogan it is actually a quite a reasonable demand in any society today where housing is really the backbone of the society and i think it is a problem that can be solved that there is enough material there is enough resources there is enough human power and there's enough ability in this country to build public housing on public land like this country has done between 40s and 80s and build public land on uh, housing on public land and house the people on waiting list and and, and accommodate people uh, families children uh, uh, on uh, the, who are uh, either homeless or facing homelessness so it's not just a slogan that sounds good it's actually a very reasonable uh, slogan that i think we should all repeat and we should all demand housing becoming a right as part of being a citizen a, 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 a resident of this country. I mean, remember the days of the Apollo House when people actually uh, 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 occupied an empty building. That building is long, long gone. It's uh, something else has replaced it. And remember the outcry of uh, within the society and the demands and the support of people understanding, realizing how deep and how wide this problem has become. And remember the conversations in terms of the government circles about housing. Remember the promises. Uh, in terms of uh, housing and uh, and realize where we are at today. I mean, it is, isn't it, a shameful act when you're talking about families in this country on the, in the waiting list, and I think the numbers are now uh, uh, on the housing list are way over 60,000 and homelessness has uh, gone way over 8,000. Isn't it a shameful act that uh, a company 
uh, investment firm, a uh, cocoa uh, 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 firm can actually come in, a vulture fund can come in and buy majority, if not all, of a housing estate in an area like, for example, Branchestown, where there's huge demand for public housing, where there's huge demand for people uh, uh, to be accommodated and housed. So obviously these houses can be built. It's just a matter of who's building them for what purpose and who's using them for what purpose. Not only are people uh, pushed, uh, pushed out of uh, any possibility of getting into a proper uh, accommodation facility, into a proper home, also then these funds who occupy uh, huge areas of housing can also manipulate the market in terms of the so-called rental market, which also shouldn't be a matter of rent, uh, ma uh, market forces. It should be a matter of needs and, and uh, social needs and uh, uh, rights, basically, and push the rents up. And, and people can be uh, pretty much uh, uh, in a situation where despite having two adults working in a, in a family, despite, uh, despite people in full-time employment, people hardly being able to afford a reasonable house for themselves and for their for their families. So on that basis, I like to repeat that the slogan that housing is a human right, housing should be a right for everybody on this land is not just a slogan that sounds good. It's a very doable slogan. It's a very uh, reasonable demand. The only thing that's missing in order to facilitate and achieve that goal is the political will and is the vision or the lack of vision of this government uh, when it comes to people and their housing needs. But pretty vulture funds and investment uh, funds when it comes to these uh, uh, funds buying our uh, houses in our communities. As Madeline mentioned at the beginning, uh, 12 houses in Dublin, uh, 15 Blanchestown area were purchased by a, 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 a capital fund. That is, that was, as far as I remember, majority of the estate. So there are houses, there are people in need of houses, but one company, one firm, uh, an investment firm can come in and buy all of these for the purpose of renting. That is really a crime, isn't it? I mean, this is, this is the worst, and it's a shameful act. And the government is not incapable or is not, it's not beyond their means to pass legislation to stop these things from happening. And indeed, as Tina mentioned, to, to uh, make housing a, a right, a, 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 a constitutional right for the people of this country. But what they're doing is actually they're talking with multiple sides of their mouths uh, and they're actually uh, uh, absolutely the politic not interested in making housing uh, 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 available to all ordinary people. The numbers are increasing. Housing, is con housing continues to be a problem. Housing continues to be a problem for working people. Housing continues to be a problem for young people, especially, be it uh, student accommodation uh, and the rents, or be it uh, uh, young people trying to build their own lives and uh, has to have their own families, be it for families who are in need of getting better accommodation facilities because the families are growing, etc. Housing is a problem for every section of the sector of the, of the society. But also, housing has become also a, a strange debating topic as well. Uh, uh, and, and that came in the in the sense of, for example, the house the Irish first, or there are too many people on this in this country, and their priority is not being rightly uh, assigned to Irish people or locals, and others are getting houses, for example, uh, migrants, refugees, etc. And that has sort of evolved over the years as this crisis grew de deeper and deeper and bigger and bigger. And I think all of these has been actually a rather very misguided at best or in, in other sense, it's been uh, purposefully deflected from the real issues uh, and the real root causes of, of, of housing. The problem really is there are no enough, there are no uh, houses being built to accommodate the needs of this country and the people of this country. Even if every migrant had left this country, some of them will be house builders, by the way, some of them will be workers, by the way, that are needed to build houses, then there still will be a huge amount of housing difficulty in this country. So it is rather the problem that's caused by the governments of Ireland than actually workers, migrants who are coming to this country and are part of the society, are actually paying rents uh, or, 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 or working as hard as anyone else in, 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 in Ireland, and therefore they are not the cause of the housing problem. So the real issue is who sits in the government, is their economic social vision 
for Ireland. This is an island that is going to speculate on housing, that is going to sell houses uh, to vulture funds, allow the selling of houses to vulture funds, or is it going to be a, a state and a government that is going to look after the needs of the people and put needs of the people before profit, really, in this case? So uh, we have to collectivize our struggle in every corner of this country. I think from local areas like Lucan, Madeleine, your area, uh, Blanchestown, Tina's area, to everywhere, in a sense. And I think we need to uh, campaign quite strongly against uh, uh, the government policies on housing and demand and support the demands for public housing on public land. I think it's very important to understand that the blame is, all the blame is with the government and all the blame is with the policies of the government or the governments rather over the past uh, decade or so. And I think it's very important that we put the blame where the blame needs to be put and directed at. So big, strong campaigns. We need a campaign on housing that grows that can put pressure and we need to make sure legislative uh, uh, changes are introduced and we need to make sure that the economic activity on housing is one that, that actually enables building of public houses on public land. I'll come back to Blanchestown to conclude with. I mean, it is a growing area. It is an area of very many young working families or, or uh, uh, it is an area of uh, uh, great diversity and it's growing and growing and growing. And it is an area in great need of proper uh, 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 affordable uh, public housing. It is an area where existing uh, old uh, previous council housing in need of being repairs. And I have seen that in many of the, uh, it's in some of the areas of Blanchestown, it is also an area that there is facilities and land and availability to build houses. Instead, what's happening is housing estates sprung up by private enterprises and other private enterprises jump onto them and buy them to rent and, and Blanchestown is suffering, equally suffering uh, uh, from housing crisis like many other areas of Dublin and, and the rest of the country. So housing is going to be very important for us. Housing actually dictates the future of this country. Housing dictates the future of the workers in this country. And unless the housing crisis is, uh, is solved, the society won't be able to function properly. And unless we get people off the streets, unless we give children uh, 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 woman, man of this country, the housing they need, there will always be problems in society and we can't allow this to continue forever and ever. And this government shamefully, again, is not acting and is not doing the right thing. Instead, it is actually uh, allowing the vulture funds to come in and buy houses. And that's something that has to be stopped and we have to make housing a right for all people in this country. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mehmet, uh, for that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to try and go back to Tina and uh, and hope that that uh, her technical difficulties have resolved <laughs> themselves. So, Tina, you're back with us. If things go pear shaped again, I, if there's still gremlins there, um, we might have to cut you short. But hopefully, um, you can continue where we, you kind of left off there. So, Tina. Great. Hopefully, hopefully, yes, this, the, I've changed devices, so hopefully that'll make a difference. Sorry about that, folks. And um, uh, hopefully you can hear me um, uh, better, loud and clearer. Yeah, great stuff. OK, so uh, I, like I, I just really what, what I was talking about after I was talking about the bill was um, the experience that I had in Dublin City Council when uh, when first it was it was presented to Dublin City Council that we would have to sell off the lands at O'Devany Gardens, a huge uh, a piece of, of publicly owned land in, in Dublin city centre um, and 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 that the idea that we would sell off uh, public land uh, to developers and retain only a small percentage of it for a building public housing public social and affordable housing um, that that actually got through the council it, it was voted upon but there was such a level of of, of outcry from the general public um, and they were slamming the councillors who who voted in favour of it that that they actually forced some of the of the, of the parties and some of the council some of the council to, to, to backtrack and to change their position and they came back to the council like oh we didn't realize what we were voting on it was such it was incredible the level of public pressure and what, what I you know what was really incredible about it was that I saw a real shift in how uh, people were, were, were very clearly of the view that number one the idea that you would sell off public land to private developers to then profit on it is completely unacceptable but also that people have now seen the idea of the private uh, so-called market in housing, uh, actually providing solutions um, for people's housing needs as 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 a as as, a, as, a, as something that's just simply not going to work, um, and and it was something that was just completely rejected by people. So by the time it came to to, to voting on the Oscar Trainer side, another side that was presented to us, 
um, another huge site this time on the north side of the city, by the time we were presented with that option to sell it off, such was again the level of public outcry and pressure uh, wa waved on the, on the councillors that, that uh, there was no question that that, uh, that that Oscar Trainer would be sold and and, uh, and, and we managed to, to, to stop the sale of that. So th there's a real awareness that, 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 that the, the, the public the public a public investment into a mass scheme of public home building is what's actually going to solve the housing crisis because if you are a student if you're a worker if you're a traveler if you're in direct provision if you're a young person starting out uh, if you're a local authority tenant i mean if you like essentially the housing crisis is affecting so many different groups in society and and, uh, and 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 the state policy has failed everybody in this country when it comes when it comes to their housing need and we in People for Profit, if you're interested, check out our housing policy uh, on our website. We in People Before Profit believe that there is an alternative to, to, to the current policies of this and previous governments. And that alternative is to put the needs of individuals uh, at the centre of how we plan and how we build housing so that we get decent, quality, accessible, affordable housing for people, but also that we uh, construct quality housing that we support workers in the industry, that we bring back better standards in housing, that when we're building housing, we're also putting in the kind of amenities and resources uh, that contribute to the creation of, of, uh, of long lasting, sustainable and integrated communities. And, and, and that's how we're, we're, we're developing uh, housing and not, um, as we've been talking about, not in the interests of making investors wealthier and wealthier. And that's why tomorrow's debate is so important, because as I was saying, it's going to it's going to it's going to put that debate at the heart uh, of, of 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 what's coming in the in the coming period. If the, if the bill passes tomorrow and we have to have the conversation about the right to housing, um, that we're going to be talking about you know who has the right and and who benefits, um, and firm put that firmly back uh, in, in, into the, into the realm of, of of housing for for people and not for profit. And will will it change things overnight? Of course it won't, because we still have the same government that we've had up until now. We've still had the legacy uh, of 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 previous governments. Uh, and 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 the, the housing policy that we have now. So as Mehmet was saying, what's really really important if this bill passes tomorrow is that we keep the pressure on not only to have the debate and have the referendum on the right to housing, but more importantly that we build a mass mass movement that includes all of the groups that I mentioned and more, all of those affected by the housing crisis, and that we make it really really clear to government that. Current policies are not acceptable. We want change. We want to, to kick the vulture funds out. We want to kick the cuckoo funds out. We want tenants at the heart of, of, of policies and, and that their rights are upheld and not, not the rights of landlords. Simple things that could be denied, such as, for example, closing the loophole on the rent pressure zones so that tenants are not facing um, an 8% hike in, in their rents, which, which benefits landlords and, of course, uh, absolutely does not uh, benefit tenants. In fact, given the, the high levels of unemployment during the pandemic, um, it's, it's putting even more pressure uh, on, onto, onto tenants. So, so this is what we need. We need people, if you're interested, to get involved with us, to get involved with your local housing groups, get involved with your local tenant groups, get involved. Because, as, as, as Mehmet said, if we don't deal with the, with the question of housing and if we don't deal with it uh, through a mass movement and applying enormous pressure, uh, we're just going to keep on getting more of the same. And, and the, 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 you know, in, in addition to, to, to the pressure that we need to, to weigh in, in terms of the right to housing bill, we also need to, 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 to talk about the Land Development Agency, which is another piece of legislation. It's next on the list. Government are trying to bring in this, this legislation, which is essentially a response, I think, to like punishing us for having um, blocked the sale of Oscar Trainer with the Land Development Agency, the new legislation is basically going to give the agency the uh, the footing that it needs to basically set itself up as a private company to set up small private companies for every piece of public land that they decide that they want to to sell off. Um, uh, set up these little private companies which will be you know completely unaccountable because of commercial sensitivity you won't be able to see what they do and these little companies will basically decide yeah we want this piece of land over here uh, we're now called you know St Michael's Inc and we are going to develop this site we're going to get planning permission for it we're going to design it up and then we're going to sell it we're going to sell it to whichever developer uh, comes in the door whether it's a vulture fund or a, a REIT or, 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 or traditional developers who want to come in and they want to develop it and they will profit from it 
and we will get the crumbs off the table. We will continue getting the crumbs off the table uh, if, if, we, if we don't um, get organised and if we don't uh, challenge through a mass movement, challenge these kind of toxic housing policies. Uh, will, will it make a difference to people in the coming years? Yes, absolutely it will. But in order to achieve that, uh, we, we, have to, we have to come together um, and, we, and we have to make that happen. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Tina, for that. And um, next up was supposed to be Gino Kenny uh, TD, uh, who um, uh, was helping to organise this meeting. Uh, unfortunately, he is stuck in the doll because they're now voting um, on Wednesday evenings, which they didn't used to before. So they now vote late um, on Wednesday evenings. So unfortunately, he's stuck in the doll because he has to vote. So. Um, so he sends his apologies um, and I suppose I just wanted to say a few words about what's been happening uh, locally in our area um, and particularly around, uh, around Adamstown uh, in Lucan where uh, it was revealed uh, earlier this year that uh, 150 houses in what is the next phase of uh, of of one of the the new estates out in Lucan called Shackleton Park? Uh, that all 150 uh, houses uh, that have not even yet been built uh, have been sold already um, to by Kern Homes, who's uh, the developer there, uh, to Angela Gordon, or um, who is basically U.S. investment uh, firm. Uh, their Irish operation is called Carrisford Capital. And uh, a year before this, the same company bought 229 um, homes in the same uh, Shackleton Park development um, to basically rent out uh, on the private rental market. Um, and those properties are now up on daft.ie they are going for uh, between 19.50 a month to uh, two and a half thousand euros a month and it's absolutely extraordinary that this is allowed to go on and we should remember uh, that it was Fina Gales, Michael Noonan who invited these investment companies to come in in the first place uh, and do this so they were invited by by the Fina Gael government previous Fina Gael government to come in uh, and do these things uh, because uh, it is uh, basically profitable for them to buy houses, uh, rent them out uh, and make huge profits off the back of ordinary people. And what this does is, of course, it does two things. So firstly, it, uh, it obviously increases the rents uh, on the, on the, in the private rental market. So uh, the more of these kind of um, companies you have coming in, they're going to be charging these astronomical uh, rents that most people can't even afford. Um, and the people are, are forced into paying because they have no other choice because there is nothing else out there. And they're, uh, they're then, some of them are even then leaving some of their properties empty uh, in order to keep those rents at that high level, which is absolutely disgraceful. Secondly, of course, what it does, and which is what has been highlighted over the last few few weeks and last months, um, is it locks out uh, ordinary people, young couples, families who have been uh, saving a lot of money uh, to try and get a mortgage, to try and buy a house, um, and they're being completely locked out by these um, investment firms that are just coming in and uh, and buying up uh, these uh, estates wholesale. Um, and um, and basically leaving people with no choice uh, but to keep renting uh, and paying huge amounts of rent um, in the private rental market. So I think uh, I think people are are seeing this happening and are very angry about it. And uh, I think it, it's time that we all kind of stood up uh, and did something about it and came out on the streets. And of course, we haven't been able to protest uh, over the last few <laughs> last last year or so because of COVID. Uh, but as we're coming out of this pandemic, uh, I think it's very, very clear. Uh, and we've seen in the last couple of days that, um, that this government is intent on making ordinary people pay uh, for the pandemic, for the crisis, and that it's time for us to stand up and say, this is not okay. We do not accept this, that we should be um, 
that we should be going after uh, the rich and the corporations uh, instead to pay for the crisis. So um, uh, just, uh, I suppose, to say there was a question in the chat with, which I thought was interesting, which asked how are people before profits uh, housing policy is different from other parties. And I suppose there's one major thing that sets us out uh, as different to others. And uh, I'll, I'll see if Mehmet and Tina agree with me on this, but I think it's in relation to how we would like to see uh, public housing uh, being built in this country. And because we would like to see public housing built on public land for everybody. And that's where we differ from all other political parties in that we want to see the social, the social housing income threshold that is currently in place uh, for that to be removed so that every single person can access public housing as they do in most other European countries uh, where public housing is available to everyone, everyone regardless of your income. Uh, which means that, of course, you have uh, you have these mixed uh, communities that uh, that the government like to talk about. But actually, the easiest way to get uh, those mixed uh, communities, mixed income communities, is by opening up public housing to absolutely everyone. And People Before Profit is the only party uh, that has uh, that policy, um, because every all the other parties. Um, are for doing other interventions that are not necessarily a bad idea, but that doesn't really go to the heart of the problem that we have. So the cost rental proposals uh, and all that, which which does something, but it doesn't really go to the heart of the problem. I think I don't know, uh, Tina. What do you think? What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I absolutely, I totally agree with that. And I mean, that's the point, isn't it? Is that is that we make public housing available for everybody who wants it, and and it's based on your ability to pay. Um, which you know, when you when you listen to the to the debates at the moment about the property tax, and 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 you know that that some people are saying, oh, the the property tax is fair; it's a wealth tax. It's not based on people's ability to pay, so it's completely unfair. But public housing that it's available. For anybody who wants it, people contribute according to you know their income, um, and 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 then people live together in integrated communities as communities should be. Uh, there's there's plenty of examples of this in the in the city of Vienna, for some for example, seventy percent of the housing is public. Um, when you when you go to the Scandinavian countries, as you'll well know, Madeline, that that you know communities are built with. Uh, so, for example, in Finland, uh, it's 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 state policy that that a state the state has to provide you with an education uh, place for your child within two kilometres of your home. And education is considered from kindergarten all the way up to the end of your of your of your schooling years until you're you know about to go to university. So. It, that kind of thinking means that you're planning communities for a broad range of people for everybody to live together and you're putting in the kind of amenities and resources that go with that. I think if I may contribute to that question as well, and I think there are a couple of other questions as well, Madden. I think sometimes radical policies are the only common sense policies. And when it comes to housing, I think we have to have a very radical and real tangible policy. And I think people for profit is, is is shining on that front because I mean it's on our website obviously. I think, I think if, if I could, Madeline, there's also an extra an, another question there. Um, a, a guy asking about what the next steps will be if this bill is passed, um, which I, which I think is an interesting question, and uh, it brings us back to the point again about how you know getting the bill passed is really important. I mean, from a technical perspective, it will take about a year of wrangling in the doll to get the right wording and and to have the uh, the, to, to have a referendum on it, but. But I think that the, the, the most important step um, is that is that we we have to we have to organise and, and challenge all of the other policies that exist because putting the, the right to housing into the constitution is fantastic. But if there isn't political will to actually make it happen for people, uh, then the right to housing in the constitution is really only you know for for worst case scenarios for people who need to go through the courts. So that's where we come in. That's where we have to keep on doing as we have done up until now to challenge all of the toxic housing policies and, and, and bring in policies um, that, are, that are actually going to put people at the centre of, of, of how we develop housing. And as, yeah. and as you say, to use the public land, like the state owns enough public land zoned for housing to build 100,000 homes on at the moment. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tina. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you could hear uh, Mehmet there. So, Mehmet, I'll, I'll come oh, back sorry. to you. And, and uh, maybe you couldn't hear him because you, you, you... No. Uh, 
Uh, no, you couldn't. Okay, that, that's fine. Mehmet was talking and then you interrupted him and then I didn't really understand. I assumed that you couldn't hear him. So um, what I'm going to do, Mehmet, I'll, I'll, I'll get you to to come back right uh, and finish your point but I might you might also deal with there was a question in there um about sort of saying uh, does it suit the government to to blame uh, migrants basically for for the lack of housing and is that is that an argument that actually suits uh, the government so maybe you could deal with that but I'll, I'll get you to to finish your point first yeah. yeah thanks Madeline can you hear me okay yeah I'm sure I hope I can hear you okay. so yeah, yeah. I was saying radical policies are needed, and and the, where does people before profit differ really from 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 the rest of the uh, uh, establishment parties, and indeed some are also in, in the in the opposition? I mean, people before profit has a very detailed uh, policy document uh, on the website. As housing is concerned, things move on constantly. The problem becomes uh, somewhat more complicated as time goes on with increasing numbers, but. I think people for profit is proud to be, to be able to 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 say that uh, we have fought tireless tirelessly against this housing injustice. In March 2017, we were the first political party to put a, put a right the housing bill to the doyle, but this was of course watered down by the establishment parties. In October 2018, people for profit brought a cross party motion which called on the government to declare a housing emergency. And I think people like Peter McVeary are saying the same things. Housing emergency is important in order to increase the supply of social and affordable housing, in order to uh, uh, make it illegal to evict people into homelessness. And I think that's a very common sense and very uh, important demand. And also hold a referendum to enshrine the right to housing in the constitution. Obviously, these are the things on the legislative front, but people before profit has also been constantly uh, of, of, of working very hard to put public pressure by the people of this country to the government in order to make housing a constant issue and through public pressure to get them to act basically because they are not going to act on their own will basically. I mean, there are plenty of details in there and I can't go into every detail of that, right? But people for profit is basically, is not sitting on the fence on the question of housing. It is, it is willing to break from the market driven, profit driven housing approach. It is willing to take radical steps, which are common sense steps, right? Is it not common sense to house someone who's homeless in this society rather than walking around that person sleeping on a footpath somewhere? Is it not common sense to house a family with two children living in a hotel room into a proper home in this country? It is, of course, common sense. And we call it radical because when you compare our policies to the rest, they are rather very, very uh, dodgy and have no interest uh, of the ordinary people in their heart. So we need to, we are very much committed to fighting the housing crisis and solving the housing crisis. We have costed the problem. We have costed the funding resources. We have looked at op opportunities through NAMA owned land and public land and everything. So we are quite scientific, quite political, and quite socially conscious in, in, the, in, the, in terms of the housing question. In terms of the migrants, I don't think the government goes out there or minorities or, or immigrants coming to this country and working in this country, like in our hospitals, like on our frontline services we have seen through COVID. Uh, pandemic, etc. The government doesn't openly say migrants are causing this problem. No, they don't say that. We, we, we don't hear it from our government. But they have created a very kind of niche for themselves, as if they are really inclusive, as if they are really caring, and as if they are really rejecting some of the far-right racist ideas. But they create exact conditions within which these forces can actually use the fear, anxiety, and anger, and deflect that anger from the government towards the migrants, towards the immigrants, towards, towards the uh, refugees, etc. So the government is indeed creating the social, economic, political conditions that gives rise to some of these forces. They are not the only reasons, but they are some of the key elements uh, of why these forces sometimes can hijack this agenda. Take direct provision, for example. I am really interested to see how the ending of the direct provision is going to become pos a possibility by Mr. Rodrigo Gorman when the other minister is not willing to provide homes for people. What will happen is, if, God forbid, two asylum seekers got two houses, which are not part of the housing stock that local county councils are providing anyway, the limited housing stock, there will be an uproar. And the government will sit back and enjoy that the fact that the anger is not directed at them, but the anger is directed to the most vulnerable sections of the society. We need to therefore reject this and say, housing is a need for every human being, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or background, or their color, or their ethnicity. 
Uh, thanks uh, very much, Mehmet. Um, I, I thought uh, I heard that Gino is here, so uh, I think he's just getting ready. He's just uh, gone, got back from, from the doll. So um, I think uh, what you said, uh, Mehmet, is very interesting. And you, you mentioned uh, Rodrigo Gorman there, who's obviously a Green Party um, uh, minister. And there was a question there in the chat about uh, the Green Party's uh, policy on housing, I suppose. Someone asked, why are the Green Party so bad <laughs> on housing? Um, so uh, I don't know, Tina, if, 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 if what experience you have in terms of um, Dublin City Council, but I know in, on South Dublin County Council, for example, um, the Green Party councillors uh, voted to increase rents for, for um, uh, local authority tenants for example these are uh, some of the people who are um who are uh, the least able uh, to pay uh, in, and including an increase of 10 euros a week for old age pensioners uh, it, it, on their local authority rent which is really really disgraceful in my opinion uh, and tina i don't know if you have any um any uh, any other opinions in terms of the Green Party and why why they're so bad on housing? Yeah, I mean, in, in Dublin City Council, um, you know, that they, they were one of the groups who who have flip flopped essentially on their on their position on on a, on the sale of public land. So you know, again, it shows you how they, 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 when when huge pressure is applied, things can change. But it also shows you that. That they don't they don't have a an unwavering policy uh, when it comes to uh, who provides housing um and 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 what that housing should be like so i mean it, you know it, it essentially it boils down to a belief that that there is a role uh, for the private market that that uh, that there's a role there for the developers um and and if you have that as, as if you can accept that then the kind of, of of policies that you have in relation to housing are going to follow from that and as you were saying Madeline, that's in direct contrast uh, to to you know to, to our fundamental belief which is that if the political will is there, the land is there, the state can borrow the money and, and can build the housing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I'm going to see if if Gino is is ready um, to go. If he's not, we'll, uh, we'll just keep, uh, keep going anyway. Um, uh, it doesn't seem as though he's able to, I think he might be having some technical difficulties getting in there, his connection is bad. So um, what we're gonna do is, um, I saw a comment there, uh, someone saying we should follow the Scandinavian policies, uh, not just on housing, but on other uh, issues as well. I would agree on housing in particular. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm from Sweden originally, grew up there, and um, it's really incredible, I suppose, what they did there, particularly in the in the 90s, 50s, 50s and 60s. There was there was a housing crisis in Sweden. They uh, basically decided to build one million homes, and they built one million one hundred thousand or something like that um, homes in ten years. And a quarter of the population in Sweden still live in those houses uh, or homes that were built. Uh, majority of them were public, uh, public housing. So, uh, and most people still live uh, in those uh, homes today, which is quite incredible. And it just shows that if there's a will to do these things, you can do them. Um, uh, but, but unfortunately, there is no will uh, from the government uh, at the moment. So, I have another question here, and. Um, Mehmet, I know you're a, a trade union activist um, as well, and there's a question here in terms of what role do the unions have to play in the housing movement, and how can how can the trade unions, I suppose, uh, help to be a part of, of the movement uh, for housing in this country? I think uh, it's, I think it's an important uh, discussion and uh, uh, one that has to be uh, uh, continued on and acted upon, I suppose. I think housing difficulty, housing problems is, are also problems for workers. It's a workers' problem, right? Especially when looking at the market-driven housing situation and the wages in this country and people's earning and borrowing capacity, even if you were able to go for a, a mortgage, for example. Indeed, rental over the burden of rent, excessive burden of rent, it makes workers working today 
the workers of tomorrow, the students, for example, already entering their lives, adult lives, through housing difficulties. And when they graduate from the university, as I think one young person mentioned in the chat, there is no possibility, even the concept of buying a house. That makes it impossible for workers to, to be able to have a safe, uh, uh, sustainable living conditions. And I think trade unions will have to fight the housing struggle. They are capable of fighting. They have the human power, uh, power. they have the resources, and they are the most organized uh, uh, group of uh, people in, in any, any meaning of the word. I think trade unions need to take housing ch challenges, north and south on, on, on all islands, uh, very serious and and be part of the campaigns and strong part of the campaigns and we have seen in the past that trade unions can mobilize they can mobilize people power as well and put pressure on the government and trade unions should also pressurize government in terms of legislation that 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 there is no vote there is no support there is no uh, deals with any government that is not looking after the workers housing needs so housing is part of the bread and butter of the workers and it can't be just seen as a social problem that the trade unions are only interested in the uh, workplace problem. That's not the case. Trade unions will have to be almost at the forefront of this of this problem and be an energy and engine of the fight against the housing crisis. Thanks, Mehmet. Um, I think Gino finally has a good connection, so uh, I think he's here. Uh, hopefully, Gino, can you hear me? Calling, calling, Gino, can you? Calling, You're here. Calling, yeah. Can you hear me? There you are, Grace. Yeah, I can hear Grant. you, Gino. Great. So yeah. uh, obviously you, you missed some of this because uh, you had to vote uh, in the doll there. You can see you're still there. So yeah. um, we've we've talked a little bit about obviously uh, what's been going on, um, but maybe you could uh, say a few things, I suppose, first of all, about what's been happening locally um, in terms of uh, housing. And, uh, and uh, I've talked a little bit about the vulture funds, but you might, uh, say a bit more about yeah. the general housing situation in the Dublin Midwest area. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about I was sorry there's a vote in the convention center here at the moment and it's so that I could be called for another vote. So it's just one of them kind of uh, things that happen on, on a Wednesday night. Um just in relation to uh I suppose in the last few weeks um there's been a lot of attention on you know uh, financial institutions, cuckoo funds, vulture funds, you know, buying up tra big tranches of houses. Now, this has been going on for a long, long time. Um, and even a year and a half ago, there was uh, a number of over 200 houses bought by a cuckoo fund in, in Lucan, and then another 150 bought in, uh, in January this year. So that's over 400 houses. So this has been ongoing. Uh, for the last eight or nine years, uh, these financial institutions, were, which were brought in by the Fine Gael uh, Labour government uh, to basically show up uh, kind of a collapsing kind of uh, housing market. Uh, and these are kind of quite substantial uh, financial institutions with an enormous amount of uh, capital kind of uh, behind its kind of ranks. And it, it, it's, it's one of the, the products of uh, housing being kind of monetized and being financialized and kind of seen as you know as 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 a vehicle for profit because bricks and mortar um have been hugely profitable for uh financial institutions over you know i i, I in the last to say it's for example like in the last 20 years they have invested an enormous amount of money because the return on housing uh can be quite uh, handsome but at the same time, as we've seen in 2009, uh, huge institutions lost and banks and obviously the, the people of Ireland had to pay it all, had to bank, uh, pay it all, um, bail it all out. So um, so this is, way, this is the way kind of capitalism has, has gone. They invest in bricks and mortar, they invest in land and they want a return. Um, now, there's, uh, you know, there's no place for these vulture funds or cuckoo funds in, in any society. Um, but you know, Fine Gael and uh, and Fianna Fáil have let this happen. Um, and how do we kind of go about kind of dismantling that? Um, well, I think you know, I think the government kind of got rattled a few weeks ago in relation to it, uh, but not rattled enough. Uh, and these institutions are still around, regardless of what kind of kind of penalties and kind of uh, barriers you've put up against them, because it's so profitable that uh, you know the return on 
their income on their capital is quite substantial. Uh, there was an article in the Sunday Business Post there last week, and uh, it, it just shows you how kind of obscene uh, this has become. Uh, there is institution, uh, financial institutions now, they will buy second-hand homes um, in certain areas, and then they will contact the local authority saying, look, we have a batch, a portfolio of X amount of houses. Would you would you be interested in leasing them off for 25 years for, for tenants? So they do that. Uh, so they're, they, they're given just below the market rate. So over 25 years, uh, the, the article kind of, kind of calculated for 25 years as uh, just below market rate, that house would accumulate nearly 450,000 euros for that particular one house, while at the same time, the house was probably bought for maybe 290,000, 300,000. So there's a, a big return. And at the, at the end of that process, um, the asset is still belongs to the financial institution. And that can be flipped a few times over that 25 year period. So you can see how this is distorting you know, a, a basic kind of need of shelter. And uh, so you have the perfect storm. You have, um, you know, the housing crisis uh, where people simply could not, you know, could not find a home. Uh, they were forced into B&Bs. They were forced into kind of on the street. Um, and this has led to a huge amount of anger. And remember, the main issue in the general election in 2020 was housing. This was a public service uh, that simply the government just made a complete hames of because leaving to the private market. And this government are extremely aware that if they don't get if they don't get the housing issue right in the next four years lifetime of this government, as when I say right, as in first time buyers, the cost of rent, you know, supply, social housing, and all that. If they don't get that right, um, you know, they're doomed. They're absolutely doomed. So they they that's why you know this I think. This could go four years, as in trying to kind of uh, get it right. Uh, now, obviously, they their kind of philosophy is to kind of leave it to the private market, and <clears throat> and like they kind of accuse us sometimes as oversimplifying the housing crisis to kind of just about supply. But at the heart of the housing crisis, and this, I would go, I would go back to say two thousand seven, two thousand eight. The heart of this crisis was uh, the lack of public housing. Uh, a policy then of lack of uh, leaving it to the private market um, and that kind of perfect storm an historical legacy of not building private or public housing prior to that and uh, this has led to kind of a crisis where the free market has basically you know uh, has been the has been at the heart of supply um, and where people are kind of are kind of bought out and you know it's inflationary and like people make the colossal amount of money so <clears throat> At the heart, like again, it's policy and it's ideology uh, that you know uh, this is a led to a crisis. Just in relation to say Dublin Midwest, uh, there's obviously huge development in Lucan and all that, and obviously we're for housing, we're for development, not over development, we're for kind of planned development, but development that kind of sees communities living together, you know, whether it's first time buyers, social housing, you know, renters, all that kind of uh, you know that situation. That's a very very positive thing. Um, just the last issue in relation to, I'm not sure if anybody mentioned about kind of social housing, public housing. I mean, social housing and public housing has been probably one of the big, big, big biggest successes uh, in in 75 years. Uh, you know, if it wasn't for public housing, uh, you know, society would be in a very, very different place. So public housing has been enormously beneficial. It has been enormously kind of a societal change in relation to shelter. Um, so uh, that has obviously that has that, that's in the last seventy five years. Uh, there's been a change obviously uh, in relation to that policy, um, and you know we have all sort of situations where there's kind of quasi um, privatisation of social housing, where there's huge amount of money goes into uh, HAPs. Uh, into kind of leasing, enormous, like over a billion euros a year go into HAP. So that's to private landlords and doesn't go, you know, back into kind of the social circle of public housing. But just one issue, which is very, very important, is in relation to the thresholds in the council. So if you're, if you're, the thresholds in South Dublin County Council to, to, uh, to, um, 
to qualify for social housing is very, very small. I think the maximum amount you can qualify for the amount you can earn net is 42,500, and that's for a family. So if you have two individuals, a man, a da, or whatever, a ma, if that earns the average industrial wage, and more than that, they do not qualify for social housing. So you have a huge cohort of people that just can't get access to social housing, and they can't get access to even kind of buying a home. So in Austria, you know, there's no kind of limit on relation to who can actually qualify for social housing. So you could be, uh, uh, you could earn 180,000 euros and still qualify for social housing. But obviously that rent would be differential. So that would be say 12% on what you earn on, you know, for, you know, the, for you earn. And that's, a, I, I think that's a much, much better system uh, because then you would get this kind of, I hate using this word, right? I hate, I have to use it in this terms, but social um, mix, because uh, the the buzzword is there has to be a social mix, and I'm all for social mixing, right? But you don't you don't notice when all the real kind of very wealthier areas of of Dublin, uh, you don't hear them talk about social mix. Then the, the wealthy don't like mixing; they're not very sociable. They like sticking around with their own people. But when it comes to working class areas, uh, you know there has to be a social mix. You know, kind of kind of insinuating that there's something wrong with people that you know maybe kind of on you know low income. I just but in, for this term, for this uh, context, social mix would be, then mean you could have a kind of public housing, uh, and there could be people, you know, sometimes people, you know, in in translation or you know, in transit in working. Some people might be not working, whatever, uh, and people are working and so forth. And there is various difference of incomes. So in that model, I think the thresholds in local authorities should be just uh, mu should be much much higher, uh, and it's obviously not compulsory if you want to be kind of on uh, uh, social housing count or council public housing and so forth so that i think that has to be changed the thresholds are far far too small we've said it a few times in here to try change but kind of, kind of hitting the head against the brick wall so uh just asking just in relation to housing itself obviously the pandemic has been kind of consuming everybody in the last 15 months but housing is uh, an issue that you know has always been there this crisis is still still there uh, obviously the 10,000 people that were, you know, in the emergency accommodation has gone down for for one reason, is that there's hotels are empty and people are, you know, being put into hotels and so forth. But eventually that will kind of dissipate and, uh, you know, the situation of, you know, homelessness will be still here. So the, the issue is the, is the, is the, is the, I suppose it's the, it's the, it's the topic of our time. You know, it's the it's a societal issue that will uh, kind of define uh, not only the term in this doll, but the generation that lives now. Thanks very much, Gino. And uh, it's great that you were able to to get here in the end. Um, and uh, I think what we're going to do is we're, go we're going to finish up because um, we've been here over an hour now. And uh, I just really want to, um, before we finish up, um, I want to encourage people who agree with what they've heard uh, here tonight to join people before profit to get involved uh, we need everyone uh, to come together to fight on this issue because otherwise um we we will continue uh, to live through this uh, this horrific housing crisis so um get stuck into the protest when they happen um join people before profit the the link is on the screen uh, and I want to really thank uh, our three speakers tonight. So I want to thank Gino Kenny TD, uh, Councillor Tina McVeigh, uh, and Mehmet Uladag uh, for speaking to us tonight. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening. <laughs>